Next up, as I said, we are lucky to have Dr. Johannes Lehman, who's a professor in uh, Cornell's Crops and Soils Division, and yeah. oh, sorry, <laughs> and he is uh, has been doing biochar research for over a decade, I believe, and authored all sorts of books and papers. And uh, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, thank you very much for the organizers uh, to get us all together and uh, get us talking. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you, uh, Barbara Lipton, for being here, and, and Mike Hoffman for, for uh, giving us this important information what Cornell is doing. So I'll um, give you a little bit of uh, a wider overview of, of uh, how biochar sits in uh, carbon farming, and then let the practi practitioners and, and industry speak about the application. Next slide. Um, I'm interested in biochar, and so are probably uh, a, a larger group of us because there's a potential to transform bad soils into good soils and, and one of the uh, contributors just said um, oh, there's, there's a possibility to improve especially sandy soils that they hold more moisture. Um, biochar in essence does what any organic matter does in the soil uh, as far as the carbon is concerned but we can also use those approaches to um, contribute to waste recycling and carbon withdrawal from the atmosphere, and, and that's that, that joint win-win uh, situation is what we want to um, uh, explore. And I will tell you also some of the downsides and the trade-offs that that brings with it. Um, I always try to mention right at the beginning when we talk about um, carbon uh, sequestration and, and climate change mitigation, that uh, for this to be effective, that we sequester carbon, we have to do really everything we can to reduce emissions from fossil fuel um, use first. Uh, we need to do emission reductions as well as carbon sequestration. This needs to go hand in hand. Next slide. Um, we are interested in climate change mitigation for in, in the soil and carbon sequestration <coughs> of uh, soil because we can improve soil quality, but also we can climate, uh, uh, mitigate climate change. And, and um, because that goes hand in hand, it, it is a, a double-win situation. Uh, those who improve and put carbon into soils, they are probably uh, uh, mainly interested in, uh, in improving their productivity or soil health or other ecosystem services locally, water quality. Um, whether that makes a change for climate and we are withdrawing enough CO2 from the atmosphere through those uh, activities is, I think, uh, not the critical question to ask. Um, this is a no-regret strategy. Uh, the worst that can happen is we have improved a bunch of soils and the farmers are happy. Um, we're growing local, uh, better food. Um, whether this amounts to a significant contribution to climate change or not, that will come uh, at the end. Um, so, and that brings a lot more uh, societal benefits. Next slide. Um, so why, why biochar? Why are we talking about something new? Um, we have already a lot of tools uh, in our basket of tools um, that we bring to bear. We can do no-till, we can mulch, we can uh, do intercropping, agroforestry, composting, etc. Uh, biochar should be seen as just one more tool to put into our toolbox that doesn't throw all the other tools out. In effect, it is another tool to merge with climate smart farming, with conservation agroforestry or manure management. Um, it gives another option for distributed handling of carbon, and I'll talk more about this on the next slide. Um, biochar is actually also not new. Um, we have uh, had biochar in the soil for a long period of time. There are even advertisements from the 1930s um, that you should put uh, charcoal in the soil because the ball bounces a lot better. Um, whether, you, whether you put a ball on your soil or, or you, you are growing crops, um, this is actually a, a technology that uh, um, has been used in the 1800s um, a lot. We just haven't paid really big attention and we didn't really know why it would do so. Um, uh, but now we have the scientific insights, and I'll show you on the next slide, um, that this is, uh, was mid, uh, incentivized just 15, 20 years ago through the findings in the Amazon where the, where the differences were so stark because the soils were so bad um, that uh, in these normal soils after just the, in the first year of cropping um, in the central Amazon, the crops are 
don't look good. This is, this is corn. This is the same corn on the right, planted at the same time, the same guy, same t-shirt. Um, uh, but but they, uh, the soils were a lot better uh, because they have actually these, um, the, uh, the biochar, uh, they are biochar rich. Uh, 80, 90 percent of the soil carbon in these soils uh, are biochar types of carbon that have been laid down by Amerindian populations about uh, 2,000 to 5,000 years um, in the past and have uh, had a, a sustainable and, and long-term transformative effect on, on soils. That's far away, but we have found this also in other areas. Um, uh, and, yeah, now I should say that um, so 9% um, of, uh, of the ability of, of to retain nutrients, and this is conveyed by these you know, little charges here on the, on the surfaces of the char um, that, that hold on to nutrients uh, and, and retain them, that they don't go into our water, uh, that the plants can take them up. Um, and uh, these, these groups, these chemical groups uh, on these char surfaces uh, contribute proportionally to a greater extent uh, to this effect than, than other carbons in the soil. So this is not just soil that hangs in there um, and, and uh, provides a sink, it's also a, a carbon that is uh, proportionally uh, uh, effective to a much greater extent to do all the good things that organic matter do. Uh, in the soil. We found that also in Africa, um, so we find it in the whole world. In the next slide. Um, uh, we find it in the mollisols of the Midwest um, that also have these uh, kind of uh, forms of char uh, that contribute proportionally to the greater extent to, to soil fertility than other carbons. So if you want to have a mollisol in upstate New York, if you want to have a fertile Midwestern soil in upstate New York, this is a way to get there. Yeah. So you're saying the last slide that 60 percent of the uh, carbon is pyrolytic, basically? Yes, okay. and and these Midwestern soils, and that comes from um, again from uh, burning of the grasslands because they wanted to keep them over open for the bisons, um, and and did that over thousands of years, um, which created these char-rich soils in the Midwest. Yeah, we also have char in the soils around here, but to a much lower extent than in, mid in the Midwest, where fire management of grasslands was a was a traditional means of, uh, of farming. Yeah. Um, these chars are actually, uh, uh, those that we use for, for soil amendments are pretty yummy for, uh, for uh, all kinds of critters. Uh, here you see that they ingest them. These are pollen bowls, uh, two different kinds um, that ingest them. They like it for their grit um, and they seek them out. You see really in these, there are actually videos that we could show um, that they wander through the through the soil animals. So it seems to be something that also soil fauna is seeking out. Next slide. Um, so back to the climate change aspect. What, what the idea is, and, and that's, that's really what we need to understand to, to appreciate the opportunity to mitigate climate change, is that there's a lot of carbon cycling through our vegetation um, that is fixed by photosynthesis. Uh, the leaves fall in the, uh, in the fall to the soil and then the microorganisms mm -hmm. eat them and the CO2 goes back out. This is uh, the natural carbon cycles, um, but there's a lot of carbon cycling through here every year. So if we were to deviate so just, just a small portion of that carbon uh, into a slower cycling, char carbon cycle, we would uh, put more carbon in soil and there would be less carbon in the atmosphere. Um, there are uh, ancillary benefits, so if you, if you do that, if you take all kinds of residues, um, uh, make uh, char out of it, you can actually utilize the, uh, the gases that come off for energy generation or a lot of other co-products, um, also cosmetics, uh, food flavoring, uh, plastics, um, you know, plastic bottles can be made. Uh, this is actually a, a, a pretty ancient um, not quite ancient, but uh, a, a industry ancient technology to, um, to generate all kinds of chemicals. In the late 1800s, practically every chemical, uh, organic chemical on the chemistry shelf was made with this, with this technology. We just forgot about that. When I was um, maybe eight years ago um, uh, visiting a, a large chemical company in, in Germany, they, they had dug out their old uh, patents on, um, on chemis chemicals from the 1800s. And they rediscovered that most of their uh, products were made with, uh, with pyrolysis at the time. Um, so we can, we can uh, uh, utilize the energy. Um, and, and there is a, 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 um, a large community of bioenergy experts that are actually more interested in this uh, part of the story than in this. But together, it makes a lot of sense. 
Um, we need to realize that when we, when we utilize biomass, any, any biomass that we can think of, including animal manures, um, that we, when, when we make biochar um, and, uh, and, and uh, energy, um, that uh, there are you know, trade-offs between the two. Uh, there's only a finite amount of that. That's 100% that you put into a system. Um, you can decide how much you want to make biochar and how much you want to make uh, energy. And, and there might be situations when you want to make more energy and less char. There might be seasons or uh, opportunities when you want to make more um, biochar than energy or vice versa. Um, next slide. Um, as with, with any system, uh, we, we need to look at the full life cycle impact of, um, of such a, a change in practice. Uh, obviously, it's not enough to think just about uh, uh, the, the amount of carbon that is in the char. Uh, there's energy needs to be invested to transport biomass somewhere. Uh, energy needs to be invested to transport the char back to the soil, um, etc. Um, so we need to think about that as a, as a whole system, all the trade-offs, um, all the benefits, uh, both in greenhouse gas terms, in other environmental effects, in social effects, as well um, as in uh, greenhouse gas emission effects. Um, one, one big thing that we need to think about, um, and, and that's, that's a stumbling block sometimes in, in conceptualizing uh, where are the opportunities here. Um, so you, you start with, with a, a piece of wood or, or a tree. Let's say the tree is standing there, um, and, and that's your, the 100% of biomass that you have at your disposal that you now decide what to do with. Um, if, the, uh, if the tree would be standing there the next 50 years, it would probably grow a little bit. Um, um, and anything we do when we take that tree down, we will always have emissions uh, associated with that. Uh, so there's no really better thing than to have the tree keep standing there. Um, so uh, when you have a tree, let it keep standing there. There's really nothing better than, than, that you can do. But if you're taking that tree down anyways because you're making furniture, um, then there might be leaves that are associated with that uh, or other trash because you're not using the whole tree, uh, you're using just the, uh, um, the wood. Um, then it's the question, uh, what is the fate of that organic matter? Is that decomposing fast? Are you even burning it? Um, we have this discussion a lot in California with a uh, governor who has a task force now um, that wants to implement biochar because they have a lot of pine bark beetle kill. Um, the way that they deal with this, they're burning the, the infected trees in the forest, uh, which means the business is not a standing tree. They have to take down that tree. They have to burn it. Um, so we can do a lot better than burning the tree. We can do some, make something out of it, carbon that we want to put back into the soil. Um, so that's, um, that's then the question. What, what are we uh, doing uh, with, our, with our carbon? Uh, are, we, are we pyrolyzing it and have something that is decomposing very slowly, uh, where we have a um, carbon sequestration compared to a scenario where the, the organic matter is decomposing uh, and is, um, uh, is disappearing and, and uh, um, into CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, when you do these, these uh, life cycle assessments of the budgets of uh, greenhouse gases, um, as done here for upstate New York with different scenarios, whether we use corn um, that is harvested late or corn that is harvested early, uh, a bioenergy crop, in this case we looked at switchgrass, uh, growing bioenergy crops dedicated for bioenergy, <coughs> or we're collecting in Ithaca um, the, the yard waste uh, that is, um, that is a collected curbside or delivered to a waste recycling facility. Um, you can see at the numbers, so there's always a, a, a stack of bars um, that are all the emissions associated with the switch in practice and all the reductions. And then there is a difference which is um, shown here. You can see that you can find very different um, emission reductions or even emission generation in this case, um, when you have uh, switchgrass dedicated uh, for bioenergy production. And so it's very important to understand where is the biomass coming from? Is it already on a truck? Um, is it decomposing somewhere? Uh, does it trigger indirect land use as possibly with a dedicated bioenergy crop? Um, or is it something that you need uh, to collect in the, in the field such as um, stover from from uh, uh, corn. 
Um, what, one second. Uh, yeah. So in, in this analysis, um, we we actually only looked at um, at the carbon flows uh, and compared a, a pyrolysis biochar system with a combustion system uh, and found that um, the 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 greenhouse gas balance is practically a wash um, whether you put the biochar in the soil and sequester carbon in the soil or you're using the biochar for additional energy production and therefore greenhouse gas um, offsets of uh, fossil fuel energy that you might need to, um, to uh, burn in, in lieu of the um, organic matter. Uh, so that means that um, if there are no soil effects, if, if we don't consider that the biochar increases crop productivity or does anything else good in the, um, in the soil, uh, then the emission reduction that we can claim either burning or charring uh, are roughly the same. Um, so that becomes then a question, does the biochar do anything good uh, in the soil in terms of crop production or any other environmental benefits beyond energy generation and offsetting carbon? Um, one of those <coughs> effects is um, a reductions in nitrous oxide emissions, so that nitrous oxide is another very, very potent greenhouse gas. Methane is another one, um, uh, but N2 is actually the, the most vicious one. Um, and, and it turns out that um, overall studies in, uh, that have been conducted so far uh, over the last five or eight years uh, 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 around the world, um, that there's an average mitigation uh, over business as usual by 55%. Um, so that's a, that's a long-lasting and very significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions through a practice that goes on top of just the carbon sequestration. Um, so this is then the one that, that um, uh, tilts the, uh, the balance towards favoring the emission reductions through a biochar system uh, if there are additional greenhouse gas emission reductions that one can claim. Um, from a financial point of view, uh, the, the <coughs> most important part is of course the back end. Um, even if we are generous and giving ourselves carbon credits and a good carbon price, uh, the, the only thing that will ever matter probably to the system and the, the financial aspects of the system, can the farmer generate more income at the back end through an improvement of uh, soil productivity? Um, and, and you'll see here some scenarios that are from the northeast um, whether we have avoided storage of, of uh, wastes um, uh, or we are adding biochar to corn, where, whether we uh, generate energy as in, in, in uh, um, these four scenarios, uh, three scenarios, or we don't en uh, generate energy, uh, whether we have a big plant or, or small plants. Um, what you see then, the balance, after we look at all the expenditures and all the, uh, the incomes, uh, sometimes they are, they are negative, sometimes they are balanced, the only time they, they are really uh, beneficial in this analysis uh, was when we utilized biochar to a valuable crop such as asparagus um, <coughs> that had a beneficial increase in, in crop yield. It was a valuable crop uh, and we had another benefit of avoided storage. Then uh, the, financial, uh, the financial panned out. Uh, whereas if we add it to, to corn, that um, whether there was an increase or not, it didn't matter much to the uh, to the financial because corn is, is very cheap, um, that, uh, that didn't work at all. Also, if we can't uh, generate energy during biochar production, uh, it also ended up in a negative uh, financial balance. What storage are you avoiding? Storage of what? Um, of, of wood, of waste wood, yeah. Uh, but you can make, we haven't done this uh, yet, but you can make the same claim, and I'll, I'll make that pitch uh, for animal manures. Um, uh, where avoided storage is, is a big deal. Um, so what I would like you to remember is that uh, if, if there are no positive plant growth through the addition of biochar to soil and no other ecosystem benefits such as lower N2O emissions uh, or improved water quality, um, then there is probably no, also no uh, financial incentive um, to utilize this as a climate mitigation benefit, even if it does uh, uh, reduce uh, overall emissions. Um, the, the economic incentive really uh, hinges on, on the crop growth benefit. Um, and, and, and that's important to remember to, to have not the wrong incentive 
uh, for doing something like that um, as, uh, as it pertains to carbon farming or carbon sequestration in soils. Um, this all hinges on, on crop growth benefits. Um, we have, well, in, in history, we have uh, um, had a, started with a very integrated agricultural systems uh, where recycling of carbon and nutrients was very normal. The animal manure of kitchen waste all went back into kitchen gardens and, and, uh, and primary productivity on farms. Um, over uh, our history in the last, especially last 100 to 200 years, we have disassociated uh, consumption of energy and nutrients from production of energy and nutrients. Um, what we want to utilize such systems for is to get nutrients and carbon back uh, to the primary productivity um, and back into the soils where we can grow additional crops, uh, which of course helps with, with waste reduction and, and costs at the back end as well. Um, we, we are starting now to work with farmers in upstate New York um, uh, to, to understand um, the, the uh, uh, nutrient and carbon inputs to water resources um, that, are, no, that you all are very familiar with. Um, where there are already numerous technologies to uh, fine-tune manure additions to soils to make this site-adapted and demand-driven uh, to make sure that phosphorus, phosphates and nitrates are not going or the, into uh, our water resources. Um, but this is still uh, a lot of hinges on, on farmers' ability to do that um, and, and uh, there's still uh, transportation issues to to overcome um, and, uh, and ultimately what we really want to do is get the nutrients out of the uh, watersheds. Um, and, and we can only do that if we make a valuable commodity uh, out of the, the manure. Uh, at the moment, as you all know, the, the nutrient values in, in animal manures, in dairy manures, is so low um, that, uh, that transportation already of 10 or 20 miles will eat up the, the nutrient value. So we need to make fertilizer products out of those uh, animal manures um, and, and we'll do that also with biochar technology. Um, this can occur on, on many different scales and, and with many different systems, um, with systems that add a lot of um, char onto the soil, uh, especially if carbon sequestration is your entry point uh, or remediation. Um, uh, the char has also abilities to retain pollutants and especially in harbor sediments this has already been used uh, especially in Europe to, to uh, reduce the toxicity of, of certain metals and, um, uh, and, fer and um, uh, herbicides and, and pesticides but one can also utilize uh, char at, at uh, very small concentrations so, uh, for instance in inoculant carrier situations for beneficial microorganisms or as components of fertilizers. Yeah. Um, so what, what I would like to, you to, to know is that um, these biochars that one can produce from different feedstocks are very different, but also the, the biochar systems are very different from each other. And, and it matters um, where you insert this kind of knowledge um, of, um, of charring and, and utilizing biochar in a system, depending on what you make it from, um, what kind of energy you produce, um, and what kind of soil application do you envision. Uh, there are trade-offs, um, and I'll show you uh, that, and I already introduced to you that you know, there, there might be benefits for soil fertility, soil remediation, climate change, biofuel, or energy production and waste disposal. Um, and ideally, uh, with biochar, we have greater benefits than without biochar. Um, but there are trade-offs between uh, making more biochar to add it to the soil versus making more biofuels and bioenergy uh, to offset fossil fuels. So we need to recognize that. Um, but there might also be uh, trade-offs between waste disposal and soil fertility. Uh, if, if our entry point is waste disposal um, and that produces a char that is not quite as good for, not quite as effective um, for uh, soil fertility improvement. Uh, I would contest that we can, uh, we can make biochars um, that are uh, very effective in, uh, in soil fertility amendment and uh, reduce waste disposal costs, for, in, uh, for instance, in, in animal manure um, disposal systems that, that we will be working for, also as part of the soil health initiative that Barbara Lifton introduced earlier. Um, 
where does that uh, sit in terms of the global approach to, uh, to climate change mitigation? Um, we have a portfolio of approaches. No-till is part of that. Um, better grazing management, better cropland management, uh, possibly better root pheno phenotypes that put more carbon in soil, uh, up to restoring histosols um, uh, in this country, probably mostly in, in California. Um, and and the, the, the sum of all of these technologies uh, might end up contributing um, to 8 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Um, and and that, is, that is quite a lot, but you see also we need, we need to leverage the, um, the entire portfolio of uh, technologies that, um, that is, that is our, at our hand. Um, and on the next slide, um, uh, this is in, 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 in Paris, uh, a, a uh, um, initiative has started that's called Four Per Mill. Uh, the French have been instrumental in rallying together um, a sizable amount of, of uh, key um, players in, uh, in, the country, in, the, in the world, uh, such as the, the European Union, at that point also the US, um, to evaluate whether putting more carbon in soil could make a difference not just for farmers, but also for, um, for climate change mitigation. And, and the, the, the proposed 4, four per mil initiative would, um, uh, would require 6 gigatons or 6, six petagram of sequestration uh, globally per year. And, and if you compare that with the 8 gigatons that I um, summed up in the earlier slide, in the, in the last slide, then you see that, that we're not far off, at least in, in the potential sequestration of those soils can make a contribution to mitigating climate change, a significant contribution if we put our mind to it. Um, and, and if we tune it in a way that, uh, that uh, this also, and it has to improve um, uh, soil fertility, then, then that is a win-win situation for farmers as well as the global uh, community. The next slide. Um, interestingly, um, I'll have just a couple more slides. Um, the IPCC, in its last report, uh, said that um, uh, that uh, uh, the, the agri uh, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, so agriculture, uh, all the, the, the soil management, uh, is really the only way uh, we can sequester enough carbon to avert dangerous climate change. So the, this is the balance of, of all um, emissions, uh, whether it's in transportation, um, uh, in other sectors, you see that over time, they all reduce their emissions uh, over the next 100 years, or, or so we predict. Um, but we cannot balance our climate without having some bars that go into the negative, that withdraw um, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Um, and, and the best bet is, and the only, you see nothing is going negative up here, except in agriculture and forestry. Um, if we don't manage that, the other savior that we have uh, is, um, is what's called BEX. Um, which is carbon sequestration and storage in, in geological layers um, using bioenergy and making CO2 and pumping it down in. Um, I, I know that you know, those who, um, who have followed the, the fracking ideas uh, will shiver also with these kind of ideas, um, but that's, that's the best bet that we have because we know that at the moment um, the, 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 uh, the potential is here to sequester carbon and greenhouse gases in agriculture. Um, but, uh, but this, is, this relies on distributed change of practice, whereas this could uh, be policy-driven uh, and, and money-driven. Next, um, next slide. Uh, so this, um, this really highlights that you know, we are at a crossroads of, of decisions, uh, what we do with carbon. We know we need to put, take the carbon out of the atmosphere. Where do we want to put it? Um, do we want to do something like BEX, where we have photosynthesis, we generate energy from biomass, um, we pump this, this CO2 into, uh, into uh, uh, geological layers, um, or do we want to put it into soils um, and improve soil fertility? So it, it becomes a, um, a societal discussion at, them, at that point. Uh, where do we want to put our energy and our, our money? Do we want to put more uh, generate more energy, or do we want to uh, put the, the, the carbon where, where I think it belongs into the soil? Um, so uh, so we, we're still here to look at um, 
uh, at different strategies of, uh, of putting carbon into the soil, uh, biochar, I think, is one, one of those opportunities. Um, it's another tool for your toolbox um, that should be inserted where it makes the most sense in climate smart agriculture, conservation agriculture, and agroforestry. Um, it needs to be site adapted, flexible, and up to date. That's what we're trying to do also with the Soil Health Initiative. Um, next slide. Um, what we need to be very clear is what these biochar systems, um, uh, what the biochar itself is, is expected to address in the biochar system. Um, and, and that's where, where the industry is, is uh, uh, a step, uh, makes a huge steps ahead to identify useful products um, that can be utilized to address certain soil constraints and crop growth constraints um, and, and will be incredibly helpful in, in, uh, uh, in providing evidence for that. Um, find an appropriate place for the biochar systems. It's often the entry point that, that matters. Do we have a manure that we need to get rid of? Um, is, uh, is soil fertility in my sandy soil the sole entry point or what, whatever else? Um, we need to develop the knowledge systems uh, and, and that's where we are, I think, the most negligent. We need to put a calculator on, on Mike's uh, website for farmers to use um, to say, you no, know, punch in where I am, what kind of crop do I grow? Um, and then the, the, um, the, there need to be some outputs of options where uh, what kind of system can I, can I utilize? Is this even, does it make sense for me to do? Um, but I think also um, what I would like to do is, is uh, have a more broader discussion uh, that uh, looks at, at what priorities, societal priorities of where we, do we want to put our carbon? Do we want to put our carbon back in the atmosphere and, and maximize energy generation? Or do we want to put it into the soil where I think it belongs? Thank you very much. <laughs> Answer any questions? And if there's time. Okay. Um, I've got a question. Uh, suppose you have, uh, uh, like, uh, when I used to work at Quantico Place, so we decided, okay, there's organic biomass and we'll convert that into biochar. So we can claim the uh, uh, carbon credit. So my question is on uh, carbon, uh, carbon credit claim. So through that, I got the carbon credit. And if that biochar is somebody is using in agricultural practices, then he all would also get, uh, he would also claim uh, a carbon credit because he is avoiding uh, methane emissions or uh, uh, N2 emissions, which is much more uh, 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 global one pollution mm -hmm. than uh, CO2. And if somebody in my UK unit, uh, they wanted to use biochar for uh, their power uh, biomass, uh, sorry, power generation, because they thought, okay, we can use uh, biochar for uh, instead of uh, fossil fuel to generate power. Yeah. Because since they are using a, a product from a biomass, then they can also claim the credit. So these are three points where one is using just to convert that organic bio mass into biochar, one, uh, 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 one uh, carbon credit claim, and then other person for agricultural carbon credit claim, and the third person for uh, power, uh, power generation. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that has got almost same BTU as anthracite or any other good coal yeah. Yeah, as biochar. Yeah. So like uh, how to avoid the duplication or duplication of uh, carbon credit claim in these three processes? Mm. Yeah, that's what John asked uh, earlier. Um, uh, yeah, that, so that's, that hasn't been really developed. Um, the, the, the easiest, um, so the methodology that is being discussed and is actually being adopted in California at Placer County, so that's, you can, um, there is a approved methodology in California that you can use right now uh, for for uh, uh, claiming carbon credit with biochar, um, but it only looks at at the conversion uh, at the conversion part, not at at the ancillary um, or downstream emission reductions, um, and uh, and so that that is uh, where we are. Um, a lot of the downstream methane emission reductions and nitrous oxide emission reductions are, are much harder to monetize and are, are also in other systems changes uh, not included at the moment. But, but I, I, I'm with you, this is, this is probably what, uh, what the roadmap needs to look like. Can I just jump in there for yeah. a second? So we are just starting discussions with the developers of the Comet Farm and Comet Planning Tool, which is 
um, talked about in the New York state law. And that's something that already measures greenhouse gas uh, reductions. And we're talking to them about potentially adding a biochar module, but it's really early stages, so. Mm -hmm. Did you have a comment to that, Tom? I, I was just going to reinforce what Johannes is saying, and I think this is really important to understand because <clears throat> people who do project management are like accountants, right? So if you can count stuff and measure stuff, it's really easy. So it's really easy to say, I created this carbon offset when I made this biochar. Tick. It's actually really easy to say, I fed this biochar into a power plant. Tick as long as you don't double count, but you can could, you could measure that. What Johannes is arguing, and I'm going to give you all a bumper sticker that says soil matters if you want to, because soil does matter. And the problem is that when you start to improve the soil, which is going to deliver all sorts of ecosystem benefits to us, it is much harder to do that accountancy bookkeeping type of exercise. So as you think through the challenges that face us as a society to make the world better, there's a kind of tension between the accountancy and bookkeeping and the things that we do that make agricultural land better. So I think that's a really important point for us as a group who care about soil to take away. And while I'm talking and you're looking at me, there's one other thing I want to say. <laughs> yeah, I a really great point earlier about manure, right? And in my misspent youth, I looked at some papers about manure, and I learned something really interesting about New York State, which may or may not still be true. So I looked at the phosphorus import of phosphorus fertilizer into New York State, and then I looked at the phosphorus waste problem in the manure from animals, and you know what? To the nearest million tons, it was the same. So we're producing as much phosphorus manure, phosphorus in manure, as we're importing as fertilizer. And as far as I understand it, globally the most limited nutrient that we have to us as a society is phosphorus. So it's kind of amazing to me that we ship this stuff out in manure, it goes into our waterways, and then we buy it from someone else. Um, and Johannes is <laughs> pointing yeah. out the mechanism whereby we might close that loop. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt because we only have time for maybe two quick questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, from my understanding, uh, how much carbon you can keep in the soil depends on a nitrogen carbon balance. Does biochar increase the nitrogen in the soil as well? I mean, how does it deal with the carbon nitrogen balance? <coughs> yeah, so that's. That has been always a, an interesting discussion, and, and I, I think it's a little bit of a um, red herring. It's absolutely true. We have a sort of fixed CN ratio. If you want to put more carbon in, you have to put more nitrogen in. Um, but we're also losing a lot of nitrogen all the time. Uh, so I think it is more a question about being more economical with our nitrogen so that we can put more carbon in the soil, rather than arguing for every molecule of carbon, we need to put half a molecule of nitrogen in, and therefore it will cost us a lot of money and energy. Um, but um, to, your, to your question with uh, respect to biochar, um, yes, the, so this is, uh, it, it makes most sense to do this uh, with nitrogen poor feedstock, not with nitrogen rich feedstock. Um, so that's why we, for instance, in the case of um, in the case of dairy manure, uh, we're looking at, at separating the liquids from the, from the solids, charring the solids that are relatively nitrogen poor, and then utiliz utilizing the urine nitrogen uh, to precipitate onto the, onto the phosphate-rich uh, solids. Um, that way we get, we get uh, a, a nice uh, separation of, of nitrogen uh, before the, the charring process and can conserve the nitrogen um, in, in the system. Uh, we do the same actually with toilets that we work with separating toilets where liquids and solids are separated so then we don't even have a, another separation step. We can, we can comfortably um, convert the solids and then find ways to, to precipitate the nitrogen onto the solids um, and, and recycle a nitrogen and phosphorus rich fertilizer back, back to the soils. Um, but uh, uh, we, we also found, as part of the, you know, the flip side of having lower N2O emissions means also you have more nitrogen in the soil. Um, and, uh, and, and we have shown that with uh, uh, several years of, of field studies 
uh, also in upstate New York, in, in Aurora, um, that we can improve the nitrogen economy. We retain more nitrogen in the soil uh, in that, that had received biochar. That, uh, this one study in upstate New York is not enough, um, but uh, with uh, the new facility that we hope to inaugurate also with Mike Hoffman's help, that there's a poster outside uh, that will be inaugurated hopefully next month, um, uh, where we will generate uh, larger amounts of char that we can start, finally start working with farmers in upstate New York um, and, and do on-farm trials with them, whoever wants um, to, to work with us on, on <coughs> testing whether that works in their garden, in their horticultural operations, in their greenhouses or, or in their uh, fields. Well, as the gentleman said back here, I mean, there's so much variability in these various soils and how uh, carbon affects it. How can you ever even decide if, if there's something being sequestered there or not? Oh, well, that's, um, the sequestration is, is easy because we are arguing as long as you convert it, we, we know what you converted it in, and then it doesn't matter what you do with it um, uh, unless you burn it. Uh, but if you can demonstrate you put it in the soil somewhere, um, your, your emission reduction as far as the carbon is concerned uh, is secure. Whether there are additional emission reductions, such as because the crop grew more or the N2O emissions in the soil were less. That's a different, uh, that's the icing on the cake, um, but, but my point here is always the farmer will not put the biochar somewhere where it doesn't do anything good for the, for the soil because it doesn't make any economic sense. Um, and, and we need the decision tools to help the farmer understand where the biochar or where which kind of biochar has a positive effect on something that the farmer cares about, such as uh, crop growth and, and yield. And, 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 then, and then it's a, it, it, a self-runner. Um, but that decision tool doesn't exist yet, not for upstate New York, nor for any other place. Um, and, and we need to get that together uh, and, and um, not put this on, on, uh, on the Institute's website for farmers so to use. So I'm sorry, question. we got to wrap up because we're about 20 minutes behind, but he can yeah. answer these questions. I'll, I'll be here the whole day, yeah. so and, <laughs> yeah, thank you.